this hour, Brother Rolf Ruffner is going to be speaking to us on refusing to obey from Zechariah 7, verses 1 through 4. He was scheduled to be on our lectureship last year, and because of death in the family, he could not come. So we're glad that he is able to be here this year. He and his wife Janice have four children and eight grandchildren. He followed Brother Tim Kozad, who spoke last night in preaching at the church at High Plains in Cheyenne, Wyoming. We would say he's another foreigner, but he was uh, from Texas, actually, so that makes him a really good fellow. <laughs> but uh, did you tell me you have to correct and just you know, straighten everything up at High Plains once you got there? And uh, <laughs> you, you, you mean it's still in the mess, huh? <laughs> No, we're grateful and have heard about the great work that he's doing there, actually. And know that he's going to do an excellent job in this subject on refusing to obey. I thank all you brethren for inviting me, and especially the elders here. I appreciate you very much allowing me to come and be with you this morning. I want to thank the brother... Edward Brantley, who picked me up at the airport. Appreciate that very much. It was a long walk, and it's awful hot here to have to walk in the airport with that thing, but I always appreciate that. And the ladies that provided the meals, and especially Sister Mowry, who yesterday I asked if she would uh, make me three copies of a CD, and bang, it was done. That's, that's the type of secretary you need to give a pay increase to to do that. <laughs> I, I put in a good word for that. Uh, Appreciate the ladies providing all the meals, and uh, no, Tim Cozad did not. I had not had clean up a thing. In fact, if you ever want to follow anyone as a preacher, follow Tim if he's been somewhere else. Because let me tell you, he left me a good work there, and helped me even helped me move in, found me a place to live. I've never had that experience. I doubt many of you have either. <laughs> Turn, if you would, this morning to the Book of Zechariah. I'd like to read the text this morning. An old preacher told me one time, he said, you, need to, you preachers need to have more of God's Word and less of your Word. And I believe that's true. Chapter 7, reading starting verse 1, It came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, in the fourth day of the ninth month, even in Cheslu. When they sent unto the house of God, Shezer, and Regimelech and their men to pray before the Lord and to speak unto the priests that were in the house of the Lord of hosts and to the prophets, saying, Should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself, as I have done these so many years? And then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When ye fast and mourned in the fifth month and the seventh month, even these seventy years, did you fast at all? Did you at all fast unto me, even to me? And when you did eat, and when you did drink, when you did eat for yourselves, did you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the foreign prophets, when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity, and the cities thereof round about her, when men inhabited the south and the plain? And the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment. Show mercy and compassions every man to his brother. Oppress not the widow nor the fatherless and the stranger nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against your brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law in the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the foreign prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it came to pass that as he cried, as, as he cried, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, said the Lord of hosts. And I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. 
Thus the land was desolate after them, and they no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. We all know this morning the history of ancient Israel. It was a terrible history of unbelief and disobedience. I think Moses said it well. Actually, the Lord told Moses in Exodus chapter 32. He said, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. They remain stick neck for the next 1,500 years. From the giving of the law at Mount Sinai to the persecution of the early church, these were people who rejected God repeatedly. Repeatedly. We know the story how ancient Israel was divided into two kingdoms because of sin. That kingdom that had started so long before, almost 100 years before, under 120 years to be precise, under King Saul, now was divided. The northern kingdom of Samaria, also known as Israel, followed this consistent pattern of rebellion. And so Jehovah sent them to Assyrian captivity in 721 B.C. They didn't get lost out there. As Herbert W. Armstrong used to say, the lost tribes of Israel. No, they weren't lost. They, they, God, they, they were lost from God, let's put it that way. Then the southern king of Judah fluctuated between faithfulness and disobedience to God. And finally, in 606 B.C., God said, that's enough. He began to send the people into Babylonian captivity. Finally, in 586 B.C., that temple, beautiful temple that Solomon built, of cedar, was destroyed. And the capital of Jerusalem was destroyed, and they were sent into Babylonian captivity. And the Lord God of their fathers sent them by His messengers, rising up the times, and sending because He had compassion on His people and on His dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised His word, and misused His prophets, till the wrath of the Lord arose against His people, till there was no remedy. Second Chronicles chapter 36. Aren't those sad words? God had tried over and over again. And now time was up. As I tell brethren, God is infinite in many ways, but not in His patience. His patience does come to an end. The year 536, though, according to the prophecy of Jeremiah, Cyrus the Great, the ruler of the mighty Medo-Persian Empire, decreed that the Jews would return to Jerusalem in 1948. No. 586 B.C. 586 B.C. And that ended not only the Babylonian captivity of the 70 years, but also the Assyrian captivity, which was about 185 years. They went back, and they went back, and there they, under the influence of Prince Zerubbabel, would be an ancestor of Jesus Christ. And also this Ezra the scribe rebuilt the foundations of the temple. But then, because of the false report by their neighbors, the Samaritans, the Arabians, all the other people around them, the Persians said, you must stop. In 520 B.C., under the leadership of those mighty men of God, Haggai and Zechariah, the people obeyed God and finished that second temple in Jerusalem. This is where we come to our topic today. Zechariah. Zechariah the prophet and priest. As far as I could tell, only Samuel and Ezekiel fill that category as prophet and priest to God. But still, God and Zechariah found a people that refused to obey God. Now why do we go over that history? That's ancient history. That's in the dustbin of history, as people say. Why even mention that? Brethren, these dates that we've mentioned... 586, 536, 606, these, I think, are the pivotal point of the Old Testament. If you understand this, if you have a grasp of this exile and this return, you'll be much less, let's say, willing or intellectually dumb to go into that system of infidelity which is called premillennialism or dispensationalism. So much excess in the world because of that, and they do not realize 
God fulfilled his word about the Jews returning to Palestine. It wasn't in 1948. And we're not, he's not gonna, they're not going to build a second temple on top of the Dome of the Rock. They've already built that second temple. You know, David's not going to sit, the Lord's not going to come and sit on David's literal throne again. The Ark of the Covenant's not under, probably not under uh, the Dome of the Rock. If it is, it doesn't mean anything anyway. It's probably rotted away a long time ago. None of that is means anything if all, if they would go and look at the history of it. History of it. But you know, our nation, in many ways, as many speakers have mentioned during this lectureship, it also has this attitude of disobedience. For 36 years, approximately, our nation has had blood on its hands because of the murder of the innocents, abortion upon demand, contrary to the Word of God, Old Testament and New Testament. People just overlook like that, like there's no problem. Now they say, well, it's become part of the law. Yeah, slavery was part of the law too for a long time. We got rid of it. We could get rid of abortion too if we wanted to. Immorality, adultery, sexual perversion are seen by many people as, quote, normal. It's accepted. It's laughed at. It's funny. And even less obvious sins, I want to call it that, such as covetousness, profanity, cursing, Majority of people out there do that. Majority of them use God's name in vain at a drop of a hat. And many of them don't even realize they're doing it. It's so much a part of their mindset. We are now, I believe, in the second generation of a rebellion. It started back, I believe, in the 1960s. I remember as a young person growing up, seeing all the hippies and the immoral people, the drug abuse, all these things in which people disregard the commandments of God. They don't mean anything. There is no authority in, them, in their lives except themselves. Brethren, how long will God put up with all this? Well, if the history of Israel is any indication, and it is, it's not for long. God has His timetable. In the year 606 B.C., He said, that's it. You go into captivity. For 70 years. Within the body of Christ, we're not exempt from that mindset of rebellion. I believe, in a sense, we are in the second generation of an apostasy that may well have begun back in the 1960s. Many of our brethren are so ignorant of the Word of God. They don't know the Scriptures. And what little they do is is their opinion about it is filtered through false doctrine in popular culture. How many brethren have you heard say, well, you know, we're all sinners. Well, if they're sinners, they need to repent. That comes straight from Calvinism 101. We're all a bunch of dirty little filthy sinners. We're born at birth a sinner because of Adam's sin, blah, blah, blah. And people just suck that in as they have everything else because they don't know the Bible. As one old brother told me one time years ago, he said, some brethren you know, don't know the difference between the Bible and the Almanac, and they prefer the Almanac. And that's the way some are. Well, what did Hosea say? I think someone preached on this this week. Hosea 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed, destroyed, ruined, through lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will reject thee. I will reject thee. As one brother already stole my thunder a few days ago, worldliness and immorality have made deep inroads into the church. So many brethren put up with things today that they wouldn't have put up in as, as a, a generation or two ago. They wouldn't have put up with it at all. It's hard sometimes to distinguish some brethren from the world. They dress immodestly. They curse. And a whole load of other things like the world does. They have the same attitude towards God and the Bible as Paul talks about in Ephesians 2, verse 2, the children of disobedience. The children of disobedience. 
But you know, God does not want us to be disobedient. Why did He give us His Word if He wanted us to just ignore it? Just ignore it or use it as some devotional thought that might make you feel better because you're in the deathbed somewhere. He's gone out of His way to inform humanity of His presence. Acts 17, verse 26 and 27 tells us God created all these nations made of them of one blood set the boundaries of their habitation why? so they might know Him they might know Him Romans chapter 1 tells about creation verse 19 and 20 did the same thing all that's out there so we might know Him and realize He loves us and is concerned about us and He continues to give us evidence of His love every day every day in his desire that we obey him. As Paul told his disobedient generation in Romans 2, he said, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Romans 2 verse 4. All of that was given. Yet my friends, why the men and women young and old, persist in disobeying God. I believe Jack Zechariah chapter 14 tells us why. Some of the reasons. One is quite interesting, I think. The deals, that I have it there in the lectureship book, piety instead of obedience. Here in Zechariah's time, they had come back from exile. At least 50,000 of them had, and probably others filtered back in from uh, Babylon and uh, the last half of the 6th century B.C. They had settled there in Palestine and uh, they had, had under the leadership of Haggai and Zechariah had uh, rebuilt started, had rebuilt the second temple. Remember, as I mentioned, Ezra and all, they had Zerubbabel, they had built the foundation then had been delayed for a couple of years. The scribe and Levite, Ezra, had reinstituted temple worship after after many years of no temple at all. As I mentioned in the book, wasn't that, think about that, wasn't that a logistical challenge? All those sacrifices, all those lambs and sheep and goats and heifers, you had to have them all there. It's said, that, at least in Jesus' time, that Bethlehem was where the priests had the herds of sheep there so they would have lambs. I think that's kind of interesting. The Lamb of God was born there at Bethlehem too. But here for the first time since 586 B.C., Jerusalem was again the center of worship. The temple was there. It was an exciting time of restoration for these people. A wonderful time. It tells how when they laid the foundation, some of the older people were there who could remember the old temple, and they cried. And some of the younger ones who didn't know that, they cried for joy. It's a wonderful thing. But then, in verse 2, the American Standard Version tells us at least that the men of the city of Bethel sent representatives to the priests there at the temple, uh, including the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, Simple question. Should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself as I have done these many years? Verse 3, Zechariah 7. Now that seems like an innocent question. Should I weep in the fifth month? What's he talking about here? For all those years, from 586 onward, the Jews had always mourned that day, fifth month, the time of fasting and mourning for the horrible thing that was done by the Gentiles, by God. In 2 Kings chapter 25, it describes that horror. It says, In the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which is the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Neb Nebuzaradan. Neb He's not from Texas. Nebuzaradan. Excuse me. 
captain of the guard, servant of the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and he burnt the house of God and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. And every man's great house burnt he with fire. Say King chapter 25, verse 8 and 9. Don't you know all that smoke went up? Went up into the air. And all the blood that was shed. All the ornament, all the uh, equipment that was there. The, the uh, We don't know what happened to the Ark of Covenant. Some say it was destroyed. Others say it was taken back to Babylon. We do know some of the other utensils used in the temple was taken back. At least in the time of Daniel they mention it. All those things. And sh surely that was the time to mourn and fast. But here was a new day. The temple had been rebuilt. It was not even a shadow of its former self. But it was there. The temple worship had been reinstituted. And these men, maybe they came to show their religious piety. Oh, we're good Jews, but what do we do? We don't have this, this time of mourning anymore. What do we do? Maybe they just were caught up in the excitement of this Second temple. Boy, we want to be part of that. That's where all the action is. You know how people are. They get all caught up in religion. The emotion of it. Sentimentality of much religion. But also we know that the Bible tells us that men often use religion to hide their sins. They did in Jesus' day. They hid their neglect behind the wall of religious tradition. Matthew 23, verse 23. The Lord said, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay the tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment and mercy and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to have leave the other undone. So many people get so wrapped up in religion, in their tradition, whatever it may be, they don't see the forest for the trees. And I may well be this is the way these men were from Bethel. But you know, sin is that way. Sin reveals our hearts, the failings of the human heart. To Jesus' generation, He said in Matthew 15, verse 19, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. But brethren, what was the real root of all this sin? It was pride. Pride. They had fasted and prayed and they were proud of that. They could show the world and their fellow Jews that they followed Jehovah. Brethren, all the prayer and fasting in the world cannot erase the unwillingness of us to repent. Case in point, we've mentioned this before. December 3rd, 2007. I don't know if it'll go down in history, but it's an interesting date anyway. Richland Hills, used to be called Church of Christ, I guess it still is, had removed their name yet. Some hope, maybe they will. But anyway, they... In Fort Worth, Texas, they announced that they would add instrumental music to their worship assembly with communion on Saturday night. Well, two wrongs don't make a right, does it? But here, this, this unscriptural, unauthorized decision, how was it made by this eldership? Of how many elders have they got? Probably 20 something they used to have that many. But anyway, it says after a three year journey, three year journey that included much prayer. Study, prayer, and fasting. Doesn't that remind you of the men at Bethel? Oh, shall we mourn now? I recall a, con a congregation, I believe it was in Massachusetts, and I didn't verify this, several years ago decided to use men and women in worship based on that same formula. Study, prayer, and fasting. Now, the nation world does the same thing. There was a Bible church in Denton, Texas, last year that decided to hire a female preacher that breaking this long prohibition they'd had. And what was their formula for justification of all this? Study, prayer, and fasting. I remember when this 
Rick about Richland Hills came out and Brother Keith Sisman on one of the uh, web uh, internet lists says what they all need was good potluck. That blow blood sugar. <laughs> that was the problem. From all that fasting. And that probably is about as good a reason as they gave. Brethren, you can study your Bible for three years or a hundred years. You can pray repeatedly. You can fast until you almost die of starvation. But you won't find scriptural authority for doing that which is unauthorized. Colossians 3, verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. How do you think God looks on all this prayer and fasting? I remember years ago, a man come, you know, in the church we we've, we've forgotten about prayer and fasting. Well, that may well be, but you know, how, how long should it be? You know, should we just should it be a fasting where you don't eat any uh, li- drink any liquids at all? You know, what should you do? There's no recipe for that in the Bible. There's no pattern for it. You want to fast? Fine. If you don't want to, it's up to you. But you know, God looks at this as religious piety trying to hide disobedience. And that's what the Israelites did too. Over in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 3, Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not. God sees not. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? God, you're not paying attention to us. We've fasted, we've done all these things, and you don't listen. Reminds me of in the book of uh, 1 Kings there on Mount Carmel, when all those prophets of Baal started cutting themselves and hollering and screaming to Baal. And what, did, what, did, uh, what did they say? Well, maybe Baal's asleep or he's gone on a journey. Maybe he's not listening to you. Elijah said that. That's the way some brethren are. Brethren, it does not take an honest person an inordinate period of study and prayer and fasting to discern the New Testament pattern of worship being unaccompanied singing and worship. Ephesians chapter 5, 19. Speaking to yourself. I speak to you, you speak to me. In psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. We can all understand that. We can all understand that. But you know what they're trying to do? It does take a long time to find some ecclesiastical dodge to get around the Word of God. Like these denominations now, they're trying to to ordain homosexuals. And so they have all this prayer and fasting, and they come up with this long uh, theological mishmash this ecclesiastical dodge, oh yes, we can do this now. Study to show thyself approved unto God, Paul said. A workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's not rightly dividing the word of truth. That's not dividing at all. So we see the religious, religious piety is not followed by obedience doesn't mean anything to God. But also Zechariah shows us the importance of obedience. Here this delegation for Bethel, they expected them to be patted on the back and say, oh, you brother, you're doing great. You're doing a wonderful job. They forgot. Zechariah was a prophet. He saw through all this flim flam stuff. By inspiration, it says in verse 4, Then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me. And that utterance that he gave was not just to them, it was to all the people of the land and the priests, verse 5 tells us. In other words, God was speaking through Zechariah. You know, brethren, people should understand when they read the Word of God, when they hear the God, Word of God expounded, exhorted upon them. It's not just words on pages. It's the Word of God. It's God trying to communicate with them. You don't need a vision. You don't need a dream at night. You don't need to go meditate on your navel somewhere in a cave. You read the Word of God. Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharpening a two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, the center of thoughts and 
Hebrews 4 verse 4. The Book of Mormon doesn't do that. Bagravita, I believe they call it, doesn't do that either. Brother, and that's why we need to thank God every day for the verbal, plenary inspiration of the Bible. Every word is inspired. But how does God rebuke these people? He refers to their fasting, not just in the fifth month, like they mentioned, but also the seventh month. Now, the fifth month, of course, had to do with the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. They knew that. But the seventh month, what was that? You can read over in Jeremiah chapter 40 and 41. Horrible murder, assassination, get alive. It was a Jewish governor which the Babylonians had had uh, installed there to take care of the Jews that had remained in Palestine, the poor that were going to take care of the land. And he trusted some of the renegade Jews that had stayed behind, the Jewish captains, and they went, one named Ishmael especially, and murdered him. Now, do you think those Jews in Bethel remembered the murder of Gedaliah? As faithful as they did the destruction of Jerusalem, I doubt it very seriously. I doubt if they even remembered it. They probably, some probably looked upon him as a traitor. But God wonders if all their fasting and mourning through the years had been directed towards him. When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those seventy years, did ye at all fasten to me? Verse 5 says. What had God done? Sent them prophet after prophet. He refers back to the old prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, so forth. And the pleading and, and all of that, ignore all that. You know, we should never forget that God mourns over sin. He mourns over sin. Jeremiah 44, verse 22 says, Because the Lord can no longer bear, because of the evil of your doings, because of the abominations which you have committed, therefore is your land a desolation, an astonishment, and a curse without inhabitant as at this day. That was at the destruction of Jerusalem. But rather than fasting and mourning, these Jews were, were feasting for joy. Why? The temple was rebuilt. They now had another idol they could worship. They didn't say that. That's what it became eventually. But this joy was self-congratulatory, selfish joy. In verse 6, And when you eat and when you drink, you eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves, Zechariah tells us. You know, brethren today have that same type of sorry attitude. They pride themselves on their fundraising abilities, how they can build a big cathedral called a church building. They can build libraries and dormitories for their schools while the world dies of spiritual neglect. Rather, they should mourn, as Jesus told the church at Ephesus, and do the first works Else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Revelation 2, verse 5. So the Lord through Zechariah quickly turns them back to the Word of God. Reminds them of the prophets of old. Men like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel who had warned their ancestors over and over again. You know, nothing's changed a whole lot in 2,500 years. It hadn't changed, has it, Doug? 2,500 years, it hadn't changed. <laughs> I, I'm not going to make fun of Terry Hightower. He's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, show mercy and compassion every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow nor the fatherless. Zechariah brings all these out. These moral failures, they were oppressing the poor. Nehemiah almost had to had to pull out some of their hair to get them to do better when he was governor. Brethren, we often forget the fundamental command of the Lord to love our neighbor as ourselves. Matthew 19, verse 9. Brethren, we need to be honest and fair with not only one another, but with outsiders that aren't Christians. But unfortunately, Zechariah reminds them that their response to God's Word was the same as their forefathers. They rejected it. They disregarded the Word of God. Brethren, today we have a judiciary in this country, as we mentioned before, that refuses to heed God's Word in the areas of 
homosexuality, abortion, and so forth. They want to make law rather than interpret law, the Constitution, as they should. What does the Bible, what did Peter say? We ought to obey God rather than men. But notice in verse 11, Zechariah reminds him, he says, you're just like your forefathers. You pull away the shoulder. They shrug the shoulder. Never forget the Bible class talking about gambling. One brother, even though he wouldn't admit it, he gambled. And, he's, and when I said, well, gambling's fever. He said, it's stealing. He said, he just shrugged his shoulder. What does that talk to? That talks about the ox. And you put the yoke on his, on his shoulders, he tries to shrug, shrug it off. That's what people do today. When, you, when someone talks to them about the dangers of compromise and fellowshipping false teachers, well, they kind of shrug their shoulders and talk about, you know, church autonomy and that's a matter of expediency and all everything like that. Matthew chapter 13, the Lord says, For this people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed. That's the way many are today, aren't they? Jeremiah 7, verse 24, But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and imagination of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. Disobedience reflects that hardened heart. And Zechariah says in verse 12, It's like your heart's like an adamant stone, or like flint, in the King James Version says. You know, 500 years later, what would Stephen tell their descendants in that synagogue in Jerusalem, you stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so did ye. That's what people do today. Brethren, do we allow the Scriptures to change our lives? Do we allow it to change our lives? Or do we just blunder on? Do we become fearless fools? So many people are today. So many people are today. My time is up. I've always wondered what uh, Brother Four Wallace would do if he was up here. One congregation I preached at in Texas about 20 years before that had Brother Wallace. And he preached for his customary two or three hours, and one lady started getting up and leaving. And she said, he said, Sister, just sit back down. I'm not finished yet. Well, I'm not going to say that. Sooner. But I appreciate your time.